All right, let's go and open our Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 tonight as we continue our study in the life of Paul. Acts chapter 13. Let's begin in verse number 1. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius and Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Cilicia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Now, if you were to describe obedience in one word, what would that word be? Let me ask you this. Do you think change would be a description of obedience? You probably didn't think about that one. Change. Change. Now that word may cause some to shudder. I mean, there are very few people who really enjoy change. See, it threatens our comfort zone. It interrupts our routines. It challenges our priorities, and it causes anxiety many times. But listen, I'm convinced that living a life of obedience is an impossibility if you and I are unwilling to change. See, there's a strong possibility that you or someone close to you will be facing a real uh, challenge of change. It may be something to do with your work setting, a change in your employment status, Uh, Maybe it's a child that's grown up and has left home to start a family of his or her own. I mean, there's a great change in the home when the children leave. And I could give you example after example of possible changes that could occur in our lives because change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. And in our study in the life of Paul, we have seen change after change after change come to this remarkable man's life. And we have witnessed how he handled change. The changes he went through prepared him for the unique tasks that God had planned for him. And little did he know it, but Saul was in for a few more big time changes. Now Webster's Dictionary gives a strange description of the word change. It says this, To make different in some particular to make different in some particular. Now, that appears to be an unfinished sentence, doesn't it? I mean, we're waiting for the last word. Some particular what? But it stops at the word particular. The definition goes on to include to transform, to undergo a modification, to become different. And maybe that explains why it's so challenging to change. It isn't easy to become different. Amen? It's not easy to become different. Though change is good, it's not always easy. It's not always pleasant. I mean, we like the comfortable routines, right? We like the comfortable route. We like the road more frequently traveled. But change, change leans to unknown paths filled with narrow passages and surprising terms. And no doubt the songwriter Eddie Espinosa understood the invaluable benefits of change when he wrote these words. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, 
may I be like you. Now those words are easy to sing and listen to, aren't they? But making them real in our lives is an altogether different matter, isn't it? Letting someone mold or make us into something different is uncomfortable, to say the least. In fact, at times, it's downright painful. And if we're more like clay, moldable and flexible and easy to reshape, changes would be a lot easier. But we're more like hard pottery, aren't we? We're brittle and inflexible. Now, of course, the words of that song are based on the familiar, uh, familiar biblical metaphor. God is portrayed as the potter, and we, his children, as the clay. Isaiah 29, 16 says, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he hath no understanding? Isaiah 45, 9 says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, Why, or What makest thou, or thy work he hath no hands? And then Romans 9, 21 says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? See, when our wills are like clay, we understand that change is inevitable when placed in the hands of the potter. And that's why David, many centuries ago, wrote the words to his own worship chorus, forged in the anvil of change. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4, and then verse 10 says this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And then he says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Can you hear David calling upon God to change ugly, disgusting habits that, he, that had kept him prisoner for so long? Hypocrisy, murderous thoughts, adultery, rationalization, a stubborn will, all those things distanced him from his Lord. And once again, I say this all the time, but let me encourage you to never read the Bible in a dull, monotone way. Have mercy upon me, O God, and according to thy loving kindness, according unto the... You know, don't read it that way. Read and imagine the anguish of his soul as he pleads to God for cleansing. See, he knew the depths of his sinfulness. And so he cries out, I need my heart changed, and only you can make it happen and cause it to last. And so he opens up his heart and he invites the Lord to cleanse it and to reshape it. You know, one of the attributes that des describe our God is the, the great physician, right? And many times we use that title when we need physical healing, right? But listen, when you think about it, heart surgery is God's specialty. Amen? Heart surgery. Though the process is painful, the results are remarkable. Change my heart, Lord. Great physician, work on my heart. Operate on my heart. Back to the scene in the book of Acts. Saul and Barnabas are ministering to the church in Antioch. They're in the midst of one of the great revivals of early church history. And the church is growing. Lives are being changed. An entire culture has come under the influence of the Spirit of God. And oh to God that that would happen in America today, amen? My goodness, this country has, as I said in my prayer request, it's just gone stark raving mad. The transgender and all this kind of stuff that we are bombarded with day after day. And people accept it and think it's just perfectly normal. Oh, our culture needs the Spirit of God today. 
We need his influence. But can you imagine the excitement going on here in this church? And every day the excitement builds. The worship, the harmony, the, con- the conversions, the growth, all so contagious. And then suddenly, God stepped in and everything changed. And there's that word again. Everything changed. Now chances are good that some of the believers in Antioch might have resisted even the thought of change, at least initially. Not Saul. I doubt he even struggled with it for even a moment. I mean, he and change had gotten to know each other very well during the previous years of his life. Let's let's review some of those changes. On the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, a light came down from heaven and he was converted to Christ. A radical transformation. Then he was led to live and serve among a whole new group of people. The very Christians that he had persecuted became his colleagues in ministry. Another dramatic change. And then there was Arabia. Change in surroundings, change of pace, change of lifestyle. And we may not know all that God accomplished during his long stay in Arabia, but we do know this. Saul changed. And from there he went to Damascus, and then back to Jerusalem, and then back to Tarsus where he stayed in the shadows for years. The man changed, changed, and changed again. And doubtless rejected by his family and excommunicated from his ties with Judaism, he lived cut off from the world that he once held dear. The converted Jew living in his hometown, a man no one wanted, friendless, homeless, directionless. For multiple years, he lived as a hermit, if you will. Yet he willingly submitted to the potter's life-shaping hands. And then one day, Barnabas shows up at his door. He's come to ask for his help in Antioch. Another complete set of changes. Now imagine the shock that Saul must have felt. I mean, here he was in the obscurity in Tarsus, where few wanted anything to do with him, to the limelight in Antioch, where everyone hung on his every word. What a change. And then he and Barnabas teamed up in a teaching ministry that Lasted an entire year. And who knows who may have been recruited and equipped with the truth thanks to their mutual ministry. Who knows how many people went out from their teaching and spread the word all through the world. Who knows? But it started with that. Change, 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 change. So don't tell me change is a dirty word, all right? God doesn't use such language. Change is inevitable, and God does change things. And in the middle of this wonderful revival, where Saul was being so greatly used, something totally unexpected happened. God decided to change things up. See, he had plans to send Saul and Barnabas on a missionary journey. What a change. Now remember, there was tremendous growth at the church of Antioch. I mean, This was a model of a healthy and effective church. Let's look once again at our text and and put ourselves in the midst of all that was happening. Again, verse 1 of chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius and Cyrene and Mahanin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, or as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them there away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Cilicia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now, Antioch Baptist Church was the place to be. Amen. Not only did they have incredible spiritual growth, they had a talented group of leaders. The believers at Antioch were under the influence of five truly gifted preachers and teachers. And each was called, gifted, and devoted, and set apart for the Lord's work. And that's exactly what the growing church needed. The right leaders to lay a strong foundation. 
And the congregation loved it because they got substantial truth, incredible encouragement, and great worship. And remember that. This was no religious entertainment center that watered down the truth. The church thrived on the meat of the word. The teaching was rich and deep. Though written over a century ago, Charles Spurgeon's words have a ring of relevance for our day. He says this, Sermons should have real teaching in them, and their doctrine should be solid, substantial, and abundant. We do not enter the pulpit to talk for talk's sake. We have instructions to convey important to the last degree, and we cannot afford to utter petty nothings. Our range of subjects is all but boundless, and we cannot, therefore, be excused if our discourses are there threadbare and devoid of substance. If we speak as ambassadors for God, we need never complain of want of matter, for our message is full to the overflowing. The entire gospel must be presented from the pulpit. The whole faith once delivered to the saints must be proclaimed by us. The truth as it is in Jesus must be instructively declared so that the people may not merely hear, but know the joyful sound. Nothing can compensate for the absence of teaching, unquote. Amen. The most important thing in deciding where to attend church is the substantive teaching and preaching of God's Word. All right, It isn't enough to attend church because you have friends that go there or because you enjoy a particular style of music. Listen, you need good food to survive, period. You know, every great restaurant has one primary element that draws crowds night after night, week after week, and year after year, and that's great food. And most of us would sacrifice ambience and, and atmosphere and location and even quality service to savor the best food in town. Now let me ask you, what makes the difference, no matter where you live, between a great restaurant and a mediocre restaurant? What makes the difference? But who prepares the food? The chef. The chef makes a difference, right? The chef is the key to the restaurant. <laughs> if you, you can have everything else, but if you don't have a good chef, you don't, have, you don't have anything. And though we rarely meet these talented people, the better the chef, the better the food. And the better the food, the more popular the place. And Antioch served the best spiritual food in Phoenicia. And it was prepared to near perfection by a group of five great chefs. And Saul fit that group like a master chef fits a great restaurant. It was a choice setting for him to exercise his gifts and deliver his best stuff. And I would have loved to have been part of that congregation, wouldn't you have? I mean, it must have been magnificent to listen to Saul of Tarsus open up the scrolls of the Old Testament and teach God's Word. And though... I, Ken, and Scott are no Saul's. I do hope and pray that we are serving substantive, the substantial food that you need from the Word of God. And Saul and the others certainly were. And then suddenly, while they were ministering to the Lord, fasting, singing, teaching, witnessing, and praying, the Holy Spirit said in the last part of verse 2, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And now, can you imagine how someone would have reacted today? You can't be serious. You're going to take two-fifths of the chefs that we have and you're going to send them some other place? That's two-fifths of our leadership. We can't let these guys slip through our fingers. We'll starve. But it didn't happen in Antioch. As soon as they realized it was the Spirit of God who was sending them on, they released them. And the change happened, don't miss this now, as they ministered. You know, it didn't happen in a lull when the giving was weighed down or during a period of leadership transition. No, God took these men from the church while they, they were experiencing a great revival. I mean, people were coming by the, in by the cartload. Uh, deep needs were being met. Souls were being saved. Lives were being changed. Families were getting healthy. The place, was, the place was on fire. 
And still the Spirit said, it's time for a change. Who would have ever imagined that? But God's full of surprises, isn't he? He sees the big picture while our vision is limited to the here and now. It was God's way of telling Barnabas and Saul it was time to move. And by the way, back then it was the Lord that did the speaking. All right? In those days, the Lord revealed himself in a number of ways. But today, he speaks to us through his word, through the gentle nudging of the Holy Spirit, and through the collective witness of people. Then, it may have been a night vision, or during a time when the disciples were praying, meditating on the scriptures, or while fasting. And others verified the voice. So the Lord said, in effect, I have work for two of you elsewhere. Not all of you, only two, and my plan is best. Release Barnabas and Saul. They are the two I am calling elsewhere. Now the change of direction came without warning. The Spirit spoke and the church listened. And in order for Barnabas and Saul to obey, they needed to be released. They did and they were. Let me make a couple of observations about the nature of ministry. The way God chooses to lead His ministry is often difficult to get our arms around. Finding direction in the corporate world makes, uh, comes a little bit easier. I mean, there's a clearly stated bottom line. There's shareholders to report to uh, and, to, to, and to define markets and that guide company decisions. But ministry matters are rarely that obvious and objective. I mean, think about that. We serve a head we cannot see. We listen to a voice we cannot literally hear. And often we feel as if we're being asked to follow a plan that we don't understand. And I need to repeat here. During the process of discovering God's leading, we are subject to enormous changes. And these are changes that we must embrace in the power of the Spirit if we are to obey our Lord's lead. And ultimately, each one of God's servants answers to God. Quite a number of years ago, there was a man who thought that I needed to fill out a sheet every day to show everyone how, what I was doing, how I spent my day. It was like a timesheet, you know? How long in prayer? How long in Bible study? How long in visitation? How long in reading books? How long in sermon preparation? All the things I should do. <laughs> Listen, I, I would never sign a sheet to please anyone. All right? If you can't see the results of what I do in the ministry without giving me a detailed account of my every day, then either you need to open your eyes or I need to get out of the ministry because I'm not doing what I should be doing. Amen? I'm not saying that too convincingly. Amen? Now, in my flesh, I've thought about what I would have liked to have done to him when I get a call to the hospital at 1 a.m., Hey, did I wake you? Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I'm heading to the hospital right now. We wanted to check in with you, report to you, you know, what I'm doing. So, hey, just thought I'd tell you that. And then at 4 o'clock when I leave the hospital, hey, just wanted you to know I'm leaving the hospital now. All right? Just wanted to check in with you. Now, I'm glad that the men, the men just looked at him and like, hmm, Really? And it won't know farther. And I'm thankful for that. But listen, ultimately, I am accountable to God for my time. Amen? I am. As I said, if you can't see the fruits of my labor, then something's wrong with you or me. And without that sort of single minded devotion to the Lord, we run risk of becoming people pleasers. All right? Pastors who become pawns as a focus on pleasing people or pathetic wimps. Nothing good ever comes from a ministry devoted to pleasing people. Rather than being a warrior for the king, it's easy to become an insecure wimp relying on human opinions and longing for human approval. And by his grace, I'll never go there. My responsibility is to deliver God, to God's people what God's people need, not what they want. 
And as I do that, the truth hits me with the same authority as it does you. And may God deliver me and every other honest pastor from the bondage of pleasing people. And we see in the situation at Antioch that God often reaches into a smoothly running ministry and says, that person is to go and that person is to say, I'm calling him to leave this setting in order to go and serve elsewhere. You know, too often we cling to people too tightly. And God has to pry our fingers and give us the grace to release so his chosen servants can obey. Selfishness wants to keep not release. But releasing them, by releasing them, we enable them to obey. And when you are called by God to go to a place where you had never expected to go, there's no need to be afraid of change. Change brings adventure, and adventure stretches your faith. And all that spells growth. Growth happens within us when we face risks head on. Faith and risk go hand in hand. And that may be a completely new concept for you. John Eldridge, in his book, Wild at Heart, is a book about book for men about men. But many of the author's principles transcend gender. In other words, they're, they're for everybody. Now picture the scene that John paints and imagine yourself in his place. He says this. <clears throat> there is a river that winds its way through southern Oregon, running down from the Cascades to the coast, which, also, which has also wound its way through my childhood, carving a path in the canyon of my memory. As a young boy, I spent many summer days on the road, fishing and swimming and picking blackberries. I love the name given to the river by the French trappers, the river scoundrel. It gave a, mischie a mischievous benediction to my adventures there. I was a rogue on the road. Those golden days in my boyhood are some of the most cherished memories. And so last summer I took Stacy and the boys there to share with them a river and a season for my own life. There's a rock that juts out over that river somewhere between Morrison's Lodge and the Foster Bar. The canyon narrows there at the road, deepens, and it pauses for a moment to rush into the sea. High rock walls rise on either side, and on the north, the side only boater, boaters can reach, is Jumping Rock. <clears throat> Cliff job, jumping is one of our family favorites, especially when it's hot and dry, and the jump is high enough so that it takes your breath away as you plunge beneath the warm water at the top, down to where it's dark and cold, so cold it sends you up gasping for air in the surface in the sun. Jumping Rock, rock is perched above the river at about a height of two-story house plus some tall enough that you can slowly count to five before you hit the water. It's barely a two count from the high dive at your local pool. There's a faculty built into the human brain that makes every cliff seem twice the height when you're looking down at, from the top. And everything says, don't even think about it. So you don't think about it. You just hurl yourself off out into the middle of the canyon. And then you free fall for what feels like time enough to recite the Gettysburg Address. And all of your senses are on maximum alert as you plunge into the cold water down below. After that first jump, you have to do it again, partly because you can't believe you did it, and partly because the fear has given away to the thrill of such freedom. We let the sun heat us up again, and then bombs away. I want to live my whole life like that. I want to love with much, with much more abandon and stop waiting for others to love me first. I want to hurl myself into the creative work worthy of God. Now, releasing and obeying requires that kind of fearless devotion to God's will. Learn to welcome the risk. Stop waiting for all the answers. You know what? Your ducks will never be all in a row. All right? Such guarded mentality requires very little faith and involves absolutely no adventure. There's a word for those who like to take all the risk out of living, and that's boring. Boring. Take risks. I've said this before, but while we were in Hawaii, snorkeling, 
I, I seriously was afraid of sharks. And, and it almost kept me from going in. But I did it anyway. And my goodness, what an adventure. If I'd have never done it, I would have never experienced one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced in my life. Fear would have stopped me from doing something that I loved. The fear of a shark. I didn't even see a shark. Which probably would have been cool to see from a distance. But it was an adventure, and I loved it. Now back to Antioch. Pay close attention to the response of the church. Look at verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. No questions asked. No spirit of suspicion. No selfish clinging as if those men belonged to them. The Lord, that they met with the Lord, made sure his direction was clear, and then took action. They released God's men to do the work that the Spirit had called them to do. And once the men... Or, and, and these two men, once released, jumped. The Spirit spoke, and God's people unselfishly responded. Verse 4. And they, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Talk about change. Saul and Barnabas left out for a new adventure onto foreign soil with the Lord out front, and they... Antioch Church fully standing with them. But this was no easy journey that they were on. Just no easy road. Life became difficult very quickly. The rigors were enough to send young John Mark to leave them and return home. Verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. While in Lystra... Saul was stoned and left for dead. And imagine that. We left Antioch for this? Serving in the center of God's will can be dangerous business. But whether in times of relative ease or hardships, the primary principle stands. Obedience requires change. And listen, don't feel guilty if God doesn't include you in his list of people to send to Africa or some other foreign nation to serve as a missionary. If he isn't leading you there, then don't go. He doesn't need you there. If he leads you somewhere else, then go there. And if he says stay, then relax and give it all you've got right here. Only you and the Lord know the condition of your heart. Is it soft and moldable clay, ready to be shaped by the master sculptor? Or is it hardened and brittle and fragile pottery from years of faithless living? You know exactly what God is asking you to do. Only one thing is needed, and that's saying yes. And don't forget, you must be willing to take risks. You must be willing to jump. And then the venture begins. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for the time that we've had together to open up the word of God and to learn of these things from the life of Paul. Father, I thank you that we can learn such great truths from studying the lives of the people in the Bible. How it can change us, how it can change our attitudes, how it can help us to grow in our walk with you. Now, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts as we give an invitation, move in us, and if change needs to be made in our lives, I pray that we would be willing to allow that to happen, to allow you to change us in whichever way that that change needs to be made. And Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.